God who created the world, wound it up, and then wandered off somewhere to do something. But I don't know what that means exactly. I, um, I'm not really sure what the difference between deism and theism are. Um, I do think there's a difference between deism and Christian theism. Um, I think I think that if someone grants deism, if they if they're really granting, if, if deism has any meaning, it means that there's a personal uh, that there's a, a being with consciousness who starts the world off for a purpose. So that's theism. So basically, you've, you've already granted deism once you've gone that far, even if you haven't granted Christian theism. So I don't think it really reconciles the dispute between me and David. The more people who grant my side, probably. But uh, except it would be Christian, but I think it's only about the specifics of Christianity. My, my point of bringing up deism was that it is a theism which is not anthropomorphic. It, it's not the Abrahamic personalistic God that Mark um, would like to get to. And so there are, my, my point of bringing that up is that there are many different notions of God which do not lead to the desired, desired conclusion of this afternoon, and that is the Abrahamic God. Uh, if there is, if God is deistic, then um, God has no foundation for ethics because God does not care about the human condition. Your point about um, beauty and and poetry and all those things, um, the source of those, I believe, again points to the, the failure of the mechanistic view of nature. That nature is a dead machine, and I believe that the, the natural world, nature as we know it, is a creative. Um, energetic force and that those properties that we call beauty and the lead to art and creativity and imagination are a fundamental part of nature and do not have a supernatural source. And that's where Mark and I differ on that. All right, questions for Mark. You used a few words that I was very familiar with, but at the same time, in the sense you used them, there's some confusion there. I just wanted to see if I get some clarification. First of these are your, your use of purpose and supposed. Um, in my experience in my life, those words have meaning in relationships. You know, as a, as a friend, as, as a brother, as a child, as, as a believer in God, there are things I'm supposed to do in, in, in aspect of these relationships. I have a purpose in these relationships. So the first of these, I want clarification was what, what sense do those words have if, if I were to live in isolation without a belief in God? There was, or there was a relationship. Because it seems your argument says because there is a God, there still is purpose, and there still is something I'm supposed to do. But if, with, without those relationships, Self, do what sense of those that have. And second, you, you, you want to describe God as being a personal being, as being outside of time and space. And again, in all my relationships, everything, all my experiences, personality, personhood, personness, every aspect of person, I understand those terms in relationship to time and space. I know David and Mark are distinct persons because as by talking with them, I see a cohesion or a lack of cohesion between the two, and those develop my sense of person. So, I'm at, so my question, second question is, what is personal? How is God a personal being? What do you mean when you say God is a personal being outside of time and space? The concept of supposed to ness, as I call it. Um, yeah, I think the, the idea of I'm supposed to do something implies that I was created to fulfill a purpose. Because supposed to has an ideal in mind, right? I mean, I'm supposed to do this. I'm, there's some goal in mind that I'm, some ideal that I'm supposed to fulfill. Ideals are things that only persons have. So I agree with that. I think you're right. There has to be a relationship that I have. There has to be a person at the back of, of all things in order for there to be any kind of sense of supposed to to make sense. If I exist by chance, then there's nothing I'm supposed to do. Um, so I don't think, so we don't exist in isolation from God, and that's why we do have a purpose in that sense. So I would kind of agree with you. I'm maybe not exactly what we were thinking, but in every respect. Um, the second part was about uh, the, uh, the question of personal meaning. So personal beings that you meet around you generally have bodies and, and live in time and space. And I have some other experience in life. Um, but that doesn't mean that there can't be a person who's beyond those things. And I think there's a good reason to believe there must be based on those arguments for the existence of God. I mean, it doesn't make sense to say because something is outside of my experience, therefore it, I don't have any good reason to, it's incoherent. Uh, it, I don't think that it is incoherent anymore. Saying, well, I don't need singularities at the beginning of my life, therefore the big bang didn't occur. And matter doesn't usually look like singularity to me, so therefore there can't, it can't have been, everything had to be unified in one singularity that everything came from. But there's, in both cases, there, there are supposedly good reasons for, for tracing these things that we do know back to these, these things that we don't know. And that's sort of the whole basis of both the argument for the big bang and the argument for the existence of God. Science tells us that the Earth has existed for four and a half billion years, approximately.
thoughts in the lake. Um, so if a loving man or and or a loving woman could evolve from a fungi in four and a half billion years, do you think it would be possible for a god to evolve from a man or a woman in four and a half trillion years or more? <laughs> if what you mean by that kind of god is Nietzsche's ubermensch, absolutely yes. Loving, loving man and woman becomes a loving heavenly father or heavenly mother. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. Uh, <laughs> That brings it into the humanistic realm. But if it's Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, then it will be in heaven. So therefore, you get that extra step to show that there is a heaven, there is a heaven. That sort of stuff, you know? And that's why I guess then we have some problem, and we haven't heard yeah, that from our I, 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 that, that sort of being, I assume that you mean wouldn't be a supernaturalistic being, but, but a naturalistic being. Well, both. Both. Well, how would. No, I don't think that a supernatural being could evolve out of the natural world because that would run contrary to everything that I've ever observed in my life. I, I don't know how you could get one category type out of a completely opposite category type. That's okay. uh, There are uh, Abrahamic traditions that are not anthropomorphic, where they do not protect their God as themselves in their own image, who in fact got procreated through a father and son, leaving the mother and daughter out. And um, in fact, um, that God, you know, they like to conceive of it, it's not only in the universe, but the entire cosmos is its representation. And I find it kind of iron ironic that uh, atheists bear witness to Abraham, but not to his God. And they probably bear witness to Muhammad, Jesus, and Noah as well, but not to the God that they were bearing witness to. And uh, the other only other thing I wanted to mention is that evil can also be perceived not as a thing but as a state. Finally, I wanted to just mention that science and religion actually are very important. Science is very important for the view among the trees, how and what physical material. But uh, above the trees, the view of the forest, that is really the job. The metaphysics is the job of religion. And really? they need to go to this thing. Thank you. So I take that as a statement. So yes. Therefore, yeah, we'll go. Next. David, would you please elaborate on your bringing feminism into your argument for atheism? And Mark, would you please respond to David's elaboration? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my point is that I believe that um, uh, that feminism and other forms of postmodernism, uh, and I, we, uh, I'll leave it at that, have, have, have brought to our attention in an appropriate and valuable way that there are human modalities of knowing which are not purely rational. That part of what it means to be a human being is to be rational, but that's not the whole picture, and that many philosophers who, who I adore, uh, uh, Kant and Descartes and Hume and others, um, um, probably overemphasized rationality at the expense of other human features, and I believe that, that, that one valuable lesson of feminism is that, that men, all, uh, all human beings, men and women, are emotional beings. Um, and, and, and and that, that it's, it's the non-rational component to the human psyche that religion has relevance to, not the logical part. Okay, but uh, uh, Kant or, or Descartes, they are in the category of non -Hume. I should have left that Hume, my, my apologies. Well, I, I don't, uh, I think that definitely people have emotions, obviously there's an emotional life of human beings, but I don't consider it relevant to it's relevant, but it's not, it doesn't provide any source of information. There's no, if something's not rational, it shouldn't be believed. And so if somebody says, why would something because of an emotive way of knowing? What do you mean? Why do you feel happy? Everyone thinks it's true. Well, that's not a good way of knowing. Um, so I think ra rationality is the foundation of, of knowledge, and, um, by which that just simply means having a good reason to think something is true. Is a good reason to think it's true? Um, using reason in a broad sense there, whatever the source of might possibly be. Um, I, I think postmodernism is really a gigantic you know, 
mishmash of confusion and irrationality, in my opinion, for the most part. Although it points out some interesting observations about human beings at time, from time to time. So, go ahead.
quite sure. <laughs> I want to be sure I have understood you correctly. You place a great deal of emphasis on logic. Is that correct, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> How does logic, and you say that in your observation, you have never observed anyone Uh, I want to be sure I quote you correctly. You have never observed anyone that uh, has had an experience that could be uh, uh, in opposition to logic. Is that correct? No, I, I didn't say that. Oh, were you talking about what, what the student I, who you made the exam? It, you, you, made this, uh, you made, you said, there is overwhelming evidence. Now finish your sentence. Overwhelming evidence. There's, a, there's overwhelming evidence against the existence of a supernaturalistic being in a human form that is the creator, the sole found, foundation of reason of, hum, uh, of, of human existence and who cares about human. You also said uh, you have observed quite a number of your friends. Have you ever observed a woman who has been given birth to four children? And how does logic explain that? <laughs> no, I, my sister has only told me about it, but I wasn't there. Um, logic doesn't explain birth, but the, 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 the biological process of, 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 of the replication of DNA and, and the gestation of, of the egg and, and, and mitosis and meiosis are all explainable in terms of empirical observation organized by conceptually consistent systems that are not incoherent and don't contradict themselves. They're not explained by logic. A mother doesn't give birth to her children as a result of logic. Oh, no. Well, then we didn't go that direction. Okay, so that's pretty much the next question. Next question. My, my question is for Mark. Uh, you, you make a connection between this God and morality. You say that there is something outside of just human interaction that you have to do. You have a duty. Now, this causes you a problem because you then have to communicate with this being to find out what that is. And how do you do that? Good question. Um, I think there are things that you can reason about, not only the existence, but also the nature of God from, from reason. One of those part of the argument that I was trying to deliver a little bit at the end of the 15 minutes. Um, I had to rush through that a little bit, but you know, that, that a God who is on mission I think you can do other things, but I didn't have time to sh show examples of how to reason other, other attributes. I think eventually, well, uh, basically, I, I think you also bring in special revelation like the Bible to this. In other words, um, you have, there's, there's certain things we can know about God, about his nature, and about other aspects from reason. Christianity, for example, claims certain things about the universe, about the existence of God, about the nature of human beings, and I believe that those that those claims match up with reality to such a degree that it is rational to believe that the Bible is a revelation from God. So you start with, 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 with reason. Reason takes you, takes you to, to eventually recognizing that there's good reason to believe that the Bible is the word of God. And thus then you have other information that you know on the basis of that revelation once you have good reason to think that it is the word of God. So from directly from reasoning, and then indirectly from the special revelation that we have good reason to believe, from these sources, we have the information we need to know about what God wants us to do. Next question. It seems to me that we're in a kind of in a debate of whether we go by science, which is facts and empirical evidence, or whether we go by faith, which is supernatural as a whole. We go by something that we can't prove, which is sort of guessing at. And we, we, I follow Mark's argument about how we go cause and effect, cause and effect. That's all science. 
And suddenly you come to the end and you're going to drop science when you say consciousness. You drop it right there. And what I think is going to happen, I, I see what you're, where you're going at, but some consciousness has got to be something, does it not? You say it's God. And I say consciousness, and we're going to discover what consciousness is when we discover molecular biology, when we discover how we evolve consciousness. And I, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe we have evolved consciousness. How have we evolved that? Well, take a chimpanzee. You know, chimp some chimpanzees can recognize themselves in the mirror. That's a form of consciousness. That's the only other animal we know that recognizes themselves. Other animals that see something in the mirror think it's another, another horse, and they just shy away from it. But a chimpanzee will stop and they'll look. He realizes he plays himself. He realizes it's himself that is standing in the mirror. But what I'm saying is we have evolved consciousness. That's a human thing. That's evolution. That's science. We're going to understand consciousness. We're going to understand molecular biology. We understand psychology. We understand the science of it. We'll figure it out. And it's not God. Jumping off the end of the diving board and, 
and entering a realm, a supernatural realm, uh, beyond our pale of experience. So uh, it's an invalid inference to go from the knowable to the unknowable. I believe that I did address the intrinsic logical fallacy of the first cause argument by bringing that philosophical principle to the fore. You cannot infer supernaturalism from naturalism. It's a category error. For the last question. Uh, this is for Mark. Uh, in the New Testament, and uh, was one chapter of Christ had just been hung on a cross, and he said, God, God, forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. Okay. Now we have another chapter. And the gift Christ is hung on the cross. He says, Eli, Eli. Well, Eli, Eli means Hebrew for God. God, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, how do you correlate these two chapters? One, he says, God, God, why have you forsaken me? In another chapter, he says, forgive these people. They don't know what you're doing. So why is it contradictory? I'm not sure I understand the basis of, of finding a problem between them. The one passage, obviously, the you know, passages in general assume a Trinitarian understanding of God, but I don't have time to defend it right now. Uh, but the one is kind of saying, is, when the, is the Son of God taking upon himself the wrath of God against sin and expressing the alienation uh, from the Father due to sin? The other passage is, is uh, Christ expressing a desire for the forgiveness of his persecutors. So I don't understand why those, why you see those as being contradictory. I don't think we can find it. Right, so let's leave at that and we can pursue that after. Okay, I think it's the last question, but two of you have shown up here. So how about very quickly if you just okay. two questions? All right, if this discussion could go on tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, for the next year, which of you two would concede first? <laughs> <laughs> Mark would. I've got reason and rationality on my side. I have reason and rationality on my side, so it would be David. Well, I don't know if David would see. Hopefully he would. We would go for him. Well, thank you for the um, opportunity to ask this question. It truly is a question. It just has two parts to it. I would like both speakers, if you choose to answer this. Um, the first part to the question is, um, if there is no God, let's say for a moment there is no God. Okay. Imagine that. Um, if there is no God, is there a problem with constructing a worldview based on the existence of a God? Does that make sense? If there is no God, is there a problem constructing a worldview based on the existence of a God? The second part to this is, let's say there is a God. For a moment, there is a God, whether we recognize it or not. Is there a problem um, with living a moral life um, for one individual that doesn't have the belief of that God in existence? That's a good, those are two good questions. Um, uh, briefly, I, I believe that, that um, in and of itself, it's not intrinsically problematic to co uh, construct a social system of religion um, when there is, in fact, no God. In fact, I believe that's the case. Uh, um, uh, what is important for human beings to coexist is simply to adopt a similar set of rules um, uh, uh, for practical reasons. And so uh, it's the similarity of, of life rituals in a community that is more important than what the content of those rituals are. And I believe that that explains the diversity of religions around the world and the reason that many of these religions, uh, the, non, the non-theistic ones that, uh, that Dean referred to, Buddhism and Confucianism, and the theistic ones of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have persisted for so long is that they give a 
continuity to, to, to communities and human life. Um, the fact that there is no transcendent source of those rules uh, um, doesn't seem to matter in our everyday lives. Um, I believe that secular humanism can also provide those rules. Um, as Dean alluded to, many of the, the moral theories that uh, appeal to me from the ancient Greeks through Kant and Mill and the Enlightenment philosophers are secular uh, um, moral systems devoid of supernaturalism. Um, so if we assume for a minute that atheism is, is true, then would it be a problem if people construct a, a belief in God? I think that even from an atheistic perspective, any construction of, of a false belief would be a dangerous thing. Actually, kind of sympathetic to Harris and Dawkins, and some of those guys who think that any false belief is going to be intrinsically dangerous because it causes you to believe in a false world and therefore causes you to act in ways that are inadequate to reality. Um, so I think it's very dangerous to construct any false view. So if I was, so if I thought this was true, I would, I would be, I would think religion was an extremely dangerous thing. Um, on the other hand, if I was making this also, I don't. I would also say, well, to a, a maybe a particular person might have a form of religion that in the in itself and that person in their own lifetime might not be dangerous to me or those things that I care about. And therefore, why not let them carry on their delusion and, until they die in what existence anyway? So it really doesn't make too much difference, uh, probably. So uh, a couple of different sides to that. If theism is true, and particularly, let's uh, make more specific, Christian theism is true, then it is extremely problematic to form a, a, a belief apart without God, because one of the things that God demands, in fact, the prime thing that God desires in human life is that people glorify Him and honor Him as God. And therefore, to construct a worldview without God from a Christian perspective is to miss the entire point of existence and to be in opposition to the entire point of existence. I have to ask you, which is that it's not the point as to who can see first. The whole idea of this enterprise is to engage in a civil dialogue of fundamental importance and then to look at our own position, other's position, share ideas, potentiality, and respect. That's the essence of uh, great American uh, political uh, democratic uh, pluralism. That's the great essence and the idea of public in America, and in that spirit. Uh, this is great was conducted, and hopefully uh, the ideas will go on. We'll get something more about it. So, like, thank you. I got from the good